can give it just uh, another minute or so. Just a few names I'm looking for that I know they're going to be attending. Sure. Yeah, just let me know. It's not a meeting, it's a web. It's a Susan, I think we're good from our end if you want to start kick it off with your spiel and then Linda's. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I uh, want to kick it off just by thanking everybody for joining today. This is the first ever virtual Midwest Came Symposium, and I already see a lot of names in the participants who were here with us yesterday for our first session. Um, if you weren't able to join us yesterday, my name is Susan Ostriker, and along with Linda Hummel and Derek Bostick, I'm on the planning committee for this year's event. This has always been a volunteer run event, and there's no cost to attend. For the past 10 years or so, we've met in different Midwestern US cities, and this year for the first time, we're doing it fully online. We hope you can make it to some of the other sessions as well. We have two more this week, and I think three more next week. Um, and since we can't all be in the same room together as we normally are, we hope you can also join us online for just some discussion in between sessions. You should have received a link to our private website where we're posting the session recordings and slides and also where we've posted some discussion starters using the questions that people submitted when they registered for the event. Um, so if you signed up recently within the past day, um, you should be getting that link shortly. And if you haven't gotten it or need help logging in, please just shoot me an email. Finally, this is our first experience planning and hosting a virtual event. So we hope you'll be patient as we all learn this together. And we hope that you'll share your feedback too on how things are going for you. Um, I have everybody on mute now, but if you have a question, you can unmute yourself at any time or type it in the chat window and we'll keep an eye on those questions as well. With that, I'm excited for today's session. So I'll turn it over to Linda to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Susan. And I just want to introduce myself briefly. I am Linda Hummel. I work for EY. And as Susan mentioned, I'm on the planning committee and the facilitator for the, our session today. And I'm very pleased to introduce and to facilitate the session to people from Enterprise Knowledge. And what's so exciting is that our participation and presentations from EY, Enterprise Knowledge has, have increased over the years. Um, and this year is no different. So this partnership that we've built with Enterprise Knowledge just keeps getting better. So without further ado, ado I will turn it over to Todd Falberg and Madison Jaronski from Enterprise Knowledge. Um, and I will also encourage you, because as, as this being virtual, it is a bit harder to uh, engage the audience. So, uh, so Madison and Todd will do the best they can do on their end. We're asking you, and I'm asking you particularly, to be, uh, be thinking of questions. Feel free to put them in the chat as we go, and we will leave a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So with that, Madison and Todd, I'll turn it to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda, uh, for that warm welcome. And welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this sunny afternoon, at least here in Arlington, Virginia, where Todd and I are both located out of. Uh, we are excited to present to you Give the People What They Want, a Thoughtful Approach to KM Technology. So how Todd and I came about this presentation was is, um, him and I both complement each other very well within our knowledge management practice. And so my side with a little bit more of the people and the culture, uh, having a background in training and development, 
and then as you'll learn on our next slide, Todd's background, um, we really just wanted to put together a presentation with a lot of tips and tricks on how to, the next time your organization decides to uh, go and procure a KM technology that you are uh, equipped with the most uh, useful tools. So let's get started today. Todd, you wanna start off? Yeah, thank you, Madison. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Susan. Yeah, so really kick things off, you know, my name is Todd Falberg, and as Madison said, uh, whenever we approach problems, I tend to focus a lot on the technology side, and, uh, and as she likes to say, she likes to handle the people side. However, uh, as you'll find throughout this presentation, that we'll both be talking about both the business side and the technology side, so uh, this is going to be a, a great presentation. So a little bit about me, uh, I am a type of consultant at Enterprise Knowledge, and with this, uh, I specialize in technical strategy and implementation. Uh, technology, technologies I work with on a daily basis uh, it range from LMSs, CRMs, CMSs, uh, all the way to search engines, knowledge graphs, and expertise finders. So uh, during today's presentation, uh, definitely be emphasizing a number of the best practices and really the lessons learned uh, from providing these services, not only to you know, organizations throughout the United States, but other organizations across the world that range from retail giants to leaders in telecom to really other management consulting firms. And uh, with that, just uh, excited to be here and pass it off to Madison. Yeah, great. And so again, Madison Jaronski, I'm a senior KM analyst at EK. Uh, my areas of expertise have been KM strategy, um, user-centric design and gamification. Uh, also, I have done extensive background in learning and development um, because as my passion for a lot of these KM strategy initiatives is we can roll out the best strategy ever. We can give you, um, you know, the best solution to meet your needs. But if your organization is not bought in and you don't provide the proper training, uh, your solution will only go so far. So today's stories that I'll tell um, are both come from the commercial and the federal side um, of my experience about how you really can get everyone with your organization, or most of them, I mean, most of them, uh, bought in and, and ready to pursue uh, your, your next solution. So, top. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so just a little bit about uh, Enterprise Knowledge and where we work. Uh, it is a uh, worldwide uh, managed consulting firm. Uh, we do have clients uh, over 25 countries. And with that said, uh, we're the uh, world's largest KM focused knowledge management consulting firm. And that every single person at EK is specifically focused on KM. Uh, and KM alone. And just some of the focus areas that you all see on the bottom left, uh, these range from KM strategy to uh, taxonomy and ontology design to uh, agile transformation change management and knowledge graphs and, and so forth. So just really wanted to set that, set that foundation and also uh, mention that uh, really from a client base, uh, these do range from federal to commercial. And when talking about technology throughout this presentation, uh, know that we are uh, vendor agnostic and that uh, we don't have a preference either way. It's more or less, uh, as you'll see through this presentation, it comes down to the requirements, it comes down to the environment and really, you know, what, what problem and, and what's being trying to be solved. So just wanted to set that foundation. Uh, when talking about knowledge management, uh, to help lay the foundation for this conversation even more, uh, this is how we're defining knowledge management as we talked about this presentation and that uh, CAM involves the people, process, culture, enabling technologies necessary to capture, manage, share, and find information. Uh, I don't plan to read too many slides throughout this presentation, but just want to set that foundation as really a starting place to where uh, we're coming from uh, for this conversation. Now, to break this down even further, uh, this is, uh, see on screen, this is really how we're deconstructing KM. And we're doing so by breaking it into the categories of people, process, content, culture, and technology. Um, it's important that uh, when talking about CAM, especially when you're thinking about technology, that we still account for the people, process, content, culture. Uh, it's important on, on how, the, how the information flows throughout the organization. It's important on the processes, such as the governance, the security, whether it's a technical process or a business process. From a content perspective, this could be a number of things. This could be everywhere from your structured information that is your, uh, you know, the records in your database to unstructured, which is Word documents, PowerPoints, uh, emails, you name it. And, uh, and the data and all the content in between. Uh, this could even include taxonomies. 
uh, in the culture standpoint. This is something that uh, I would say is a major pain point that we see uh, really all across the world is just, you know, willingness to, to share and collaborate and support. Uh, I feel like uh, every now and again, the organization is like, oh, yeah, definitely focused on culture. Uh, and I think uh, I would say a lot of organizations, they definitely have the focus on culture. But uh, as we all know, you know, culture is not something that you can perfect overnight and something that has to be worked on and improved with over time. And it's something that you cannot lose sight of. And lastly, technology. And there's a reason why talking about technology last, even though this is a, essentially a technology presentation, is that we find technology as an enabler. Uh, very, very many times often is that, uh, you know, clients come to us or we see on message forms or meetups or, you know, all throughout, you know, social, social and collaboration is that people say, oh, I just want to buy a platform. I just want to buy this. I just want to buy that. Or, oh, I'll have a computer do that for me. Well, that tends to fail. Uh, nine times out of 10, actually, I would say 99 times out of 100, uh, if people process content culture is not considered uh, when leveraging technology, then uh, more or less going to have a lot of struggles down the road and have trouble for adoption or people just may never use it. Uh, and ultimately, at the end of the day, be a waste of money and waste of time uh, on everyone's day. So to roll over into uh, this technology aspect and really emphasize uh, really the KM aspect on the previous slide, I mentioned the KM platform, the KM suite. Uh, this is a much more layered way of looking at that. Uh, one of the things uh, that we always come across and, and always find is that uh, technology or platforms or solutions are say, oh, this is a perfect CAM platform. This is a perfect CAM solution. It does this, this, and this. Or we go to an IT department and they're like, oh, yeah, we have the CAM solution for the entire organization. However, they're just using it in IT for IT and it only stores documents or it only allows uh, one team to talk to another. However, when we're talking about KM ecosystem, it's bigger than that. It's something that takes a number of systems, a number of solutions and efforts to really make it whole. And as you can see, uh, really at the top, there's the centralized UI. This is something that, uh, is something that you know, most end users will interact with on a daily basis. This is that that central interface that they can go to, to share information, to collaborate, to, uh, to upload information, download information, to set security processes, flows. However, if you see throughout the slide that it continues to have multiple layers on really what defines this CAM ecosystem. And I'm sure uh, you probably have a few in mind when you start looking at, okay, you know, we have a content management system that could be SharePoint. Okay, SharePoint holds documents. It has uh, you know, there's a Dynamics 365 from Microsoft that could do the CRM. And you start seeing that different platforms that we use on a daily basis start to fit into this ecosystem and that these various layers make that ecosystem whole and continue to make it much more CAM centric instead of, uh, so it's more of doing CAM versus just talking about it or giving it a label. So. Uh, to really wrap it up, wrap it up. There's just there's just a lot on this slide, and definitely uh, open for questions and chat uh, in the event you all have some. But uh, really, you know, these layers are important uh, to each other, and that uh, often find that platforms don't always have all of these, and it's very difficult to to give them a label of a total CAM solution if if they're missing things. So with this, I'm going to pass it off to Madison. Yeah. So. Really, you know, thanks Todd for setting that groundwork for us for the rest of the presentation. And one thing we also wanted to do um, before we got into it was pull the audience. Um, these are some of the reasons why we've seen KM technology efforts fail in the past, um, either um, through our individual, um, just kind of back and forth with clients or just things that we've seen in the industry. So are there any efforts, um, you know, reasons for failures from your end that either you as a consultant or as a practitioner have come across um, in your time with KM technology efforts. We'll leave the chat open for a few minutes. And in the meantime, while we're working on that, we'll tell a story. Um, one of Todd and I's first projects together was for a, um, a federal bank and we had the individual come to us and really during the kickoff say, 
okay, you know, we're embarrassed to say this, but the first route we went was a solution base. And he's like, you couldn't imagine um, the resources that we unfortunately didn't fully utilize or get any return on um, because to Todd's point on that deconstructing KM page, they forgot about the people or the culture or the processes. Um, and oop, they're starting to come through. So yeah, exactly, Sharon, you know, just buying a technology as Todd said, you know, there is no silver bullet out there. Um, and it certainly is a ecosystem. Um, yeah, Jamie, no change management plan. It's more, hey, here you go. You were frustrated, here's your solution, best of luck. Um, lack of governance, yes. Um, that the view of the system, yes, Gabriella, you know, we'll talk about that today during our presentation of make sure you really have that full 360 view of your organization um, because you don't know a lot of the times what you have in house already that could either help or, you know, actually it's just being utilizing correctly or, you know, maybe um, a repetitive with your new solution. Um, and, and yes, always senior leadership. Uh, a lot of the times decisions like this are sometimes started within the middle management level and it really does take the entire support of the organization um, because a lot of the times knowledge workers will look to senior leadership to see, oh, are, are they embodying what it's being asked of us? So thank you all so much um, for, you know, chiming in there. I, I can see that we certainly will be in good company for the rest of the presentation um, and, and hopefully the next four phases uh, will give you all some insights to consider uh, next time you do a KM technology procurement. So next slide. And again, also you'll see this throughout the next four phases um, at EK and you know with Todd and I, we really try to uh, be deliberate and thoughtful with KM. So uh, a lot of the times we found that KM sometimes is too theoretical. It's a little bit more um, just a different approach to it. So what we really try to do in all of our efforts is anchor in business value and in end user uh, wants and needs. So putting that in, you know, KM in, in terms of results and having that active communication, being iterative, uh, you know, rolling it all out. Just make sure that when you're doing something as large scale as a KM effort, and especially when it includes a technology, that you really, really have all of your ducks in a row um, before you start progressing forward. And with that, let's get into phase one. So phase one, gathering requirements and defining personas, um, certainly very necessary for any engagement. And at EK, typically the approach that we take to this phase one is a top-down, bottom-up. So top-down, speaking with individuals, really having that user-centric, human-driven approach. Um, taking the time to have those 30, 45 minute discussions with individuals. Um, also a tidbit, we typically always go into those interviews with a set of interview questions. Um, I know a lot of the times it's you know, easy, especially uh, for consultants, you either want to solutionize or you want to think so far ahead. Uh, the, we found that the questions really help us navigate those interviews and keep us paced and keep us on point. Um, so it's good to have that when you're doing your top 10 analysis. Um, also facilitated workshops, getting people to move, move around, use stickies, use dots. Um, certainly a fun way um, and, and also kind of lessens the pressure a little bit. Um, sometimes when we go into organizations, knowledge workers are very tense because they either feel that, you know, there's a problem because they're not doing something correctly or they're frustrated. So bringing into an open space, having that open dialogue um, will really help you get that qualitative data that you need without any interference um, of, of frustrations or feeling as though they can't open up. Um, from the bottom side, the bottom analysis, it's really just looking at those documents, looking at the document sets, at the systems, um, having those demonstrations, you know, really asking your client or your fellow colleagues, hey, can, you know, I've used system X before, but you know, you're, you're the lead on that system. Can you really show me what it can do? Uh, because a lot of the times also we find that our clients, especially if it comes from a business unit instead of potentially an enterprise effort, is that the business unit may be lacking insight into what the other business unit uses X system for or what how they capitalize on it. So ensure that your bottom analysis, bottom up analysis is as wide as possible, not too wide, not trying to boil the ocean, but is large enough that you can feel comfortable knowing that the requirements and the data you're gathering is actually descriptive of your entire um, organ organization's challenge. Next slide, Todd. 
Yeah. And so again, um, there are various ways to define requirements. Uh, typically, when we go into an organization, the customer or the client is used to defining functional and technical requirements. Um, some best cases, they have both, um, or they're used to defining both. But a lot of the times, it's a little bit of an education to bring up because really when you're looking for that KM technology, you want to do, you want to look at um, what should it do. So functionally, what's, what is those requirements that are desired? And then also, how should you do it? Um, or how should it do it? So those technical requirements, um, what needs to be in there? Um, you know, Todd can speak to those a little bit uh, better, but then also, and this is something that we introduce a lot of, to our clients is what are those exploratory requirements? What does that three to five years look like after it's implemented? Um, we find that a lot of the times when our clients are looking through KM technologies, they're looking at that immediate price or that immediate fix. But again, you know, does business unit A have this initiative coming? Should we make sure that it can be flexible enough um, to expand and progress along side the organization. Um, and, and Todd, do you want to add in some insight on this slide as well? Yeah, I definitely want to drive home a little bit of the, uh, the technical aspect and a little bit on the exploratory. Uh, one of the big, you know, one of the big questions that we have from a technical requirement standpoint these days when, you know, determining technology on what to do or how to do it, uh, it tends to come down to, do we want an open source uh, solution? Do we want uh, off the shelf? How do we want to do this? Do we want more subscription? And uh, it's definitely something that uh, is one of the bigger challenges because, you know, they have different costs that sink into them on how, on how you want to, uh, you know, proceed and how much you want to develop. Uh, and with that, you know, that really comes down to, you know, if you're going open source, it really comes down to like the programming language. Uh, I've seen a few organizations where uh, they're like, oh, we don't, we want to be cheap. We have developers. Uh, we're just going to get something off the shelf or, I mean, open source, it'll be easy to do. Uh, we can just do it ourselves, no problem. But when looking at the expertise of what their developers, like the programming languages that they're familiar with, uh, the the solutions that would have that would that aligned up with their requirements were developed in entirely different languages that they were not familiar with. So it was not compatible. And these are the types of things that you want to define early on because you want to ensure that what you're selecting is something that not only meets your needs from a functional standpoint, but also from that technical standpoint that IT can actually support it. Because uh, as someone who uh, you know, really started their career in IT, started as a developer, uh, it'd be probably a regular basis to where someone for business would walk in and be like, oh, uh, here's new technology, we just bought it, uh, can you support me? And the first question is like, uh, what is this? Why, why, why do we have this? We, we already have te technology that could do this. Uh, so it's, there's always those questions or it's, oh, that's really advanced. I don't know anything about that. Good luck. So there's a, there's a wide range of, of routes this can go. And, and I think the last one to really call out is the exploratory requirements. And this is something that uh, is also really comes down to the, the bottom dollar too. And that's really the, the community of that platform. Uh, you'll find that, you know, it's kind of goes hand in hand with, the, the programming language that the, that the applications are being developed in and that the more popular applications, uh, that programming language is going to obviously be a lot more popular. It's going to be on the job market. Now you think about from the community standpoint, if you have a platform that everyone uses, then there's a great chance that there's a large community built around there. So if that platform breaks or you want to further mature it or increase functionality, do you want to hire someone to do it for you? Or do you want to rely on your trusted IT to you know, do, the research, do the research and go to that community and figure out how to do it themselves? Uh, IT can do a lot, but you have to give IT the needs to succeed. And if there's a community that they can reference for uh, tips or plugins, you think of like the WordPresses and the Drupals, that's a large community that not only has a lot of developers that support that type of application, but there's a lot of possibilities on how you can further expand that without having to, to hire someone special to do that. So just wanted to call out those two technical and uh, that exploratory requirements. So thanks, Madison. Yeah, Todd, there was a, a question from Sundaraj in the chat that I wanted to bring up before we move on. So he says, any idea what percentage of the WYSIWYG KM solution module of ITSMs like Remedy is actually used or whether they are used at all? 
That's a good question, and thank you for bringing that up. So I would say the WYSIWYGs, uh, I, I would say it's becoming, not, start to be a lot more uh, a popular feature to where even platforms that uh, say they're advanced, uh, really the only advanced thing on them is more of uh, the WYSIWYG. Uh, however, to uh, I would say nowadays we're starting to see a trend where it's more or less, uh, people are focusing, organizations are focusing on creating content in one central location to where it's not so much about the WYSIWYG or the, you know, the what you see is what you get. It's more about creating content in one location and then have it publishing to various other streams and various other platforms at the same time. So um, I would say percentages of that actually used, whether used at all, I would honestly say 50%. Um, and even with that, it, uh, yeah, I, I would have to go 50% just because, uh, you know, WYSIWYG is starting to become a lot more popular, but it's also something that, um, yeah, it, I'll go 50%, sorry. <laughs> a lot could be said. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. And Todd, next slide. So again, kind of just, you know, from my wheelhouse, the personas and user stories. So as you're collecting um, all of your data, whether it be through the interviews, the workshops, or from technical requirement, requirement discussions and um, with IT, make sure you're building those personas, personas and user stories. So the personas, um, as, as many of you know, really put a face to the name of your end users or individuals who will support, uh, you know, for example, typically when we do a taxonomy management solution, um, we're putting together a, a persona for um, the tool administrator, um, the taxonomy management administrator. Um, so, you know, the person who's going to own the tool, who's going to manage the taxonomy within the tool, what are those end users? What does an end user look like? And then also who's the executive sponsor? Um, so just really ensure that as you're going about, you're talking with individuals, you're really trying to look at um, who are those people going to make? And yes, Jim, um, in addition to personas, we do sometimes use client journey maps, really depending on, um, you know, kind of the scope of the work. And if our client has asked um, for us to take that additional step, typically though, in most um, baseline KM strategy efforts, we just do uh, personas or user stories. Um, and the user stories really help, again, you know, bolster that knowledge of the persona, um, you know, in the role of, I want to do so that. Um, so, you know, really kind to put, starting to put those requirements, both qualitative and quantitative, um, into something that you can easily reference and something that's a little bit more transferable to a conversation that you'd have with a, with a vendor or with your business. So again, you're coming back, you're putting that KM in terms of the business, in terms of results. <laughs> and, and, and yes, Linda, um, the design thinking methodology definitely factors into our process. Um, at EK, that's something we typically do. Um, we have hints of it throughout all of our engagements because we are great fans of the design thinking process. Um, as I alluded to in the workshops, the sticky notes, the, the dots, really trying to connect with those end users, connect with those individuals in the room and figure out how do we really build something that isn't going to have my blind spot. Um, you know, I can only build a solution as good as how much I understand you. Um, it's, it's not me, it's you. So we really try to drive that home. And that'll lead into Todd's next slide. Yeah, thank you, Madison. Yeah, so really phase two uh, is where we start, you know, building off of phase one and, you know, building off the personas and the requirements caption. We start getting into the really the data-driven evaluation components of, you know, of the CAM technology. And we tend to approach these really from, uh, or this route really from two methods. We're real, I would say two key methods, but there's really four overall, um, four overall components of this. Uh, I would say, so the first component, you know, that's really defining that, that vendor rating rubric. This is something that uh, we tend to start in the very beginning of, uh, you know, the CAM technology engagement to where it's, a way to capture all those requirements, all those personas in one location. And then for the two major areas, there's the vendor demonstrations, and then there's the proof of concepts, uh, which I'll talk about those in a little bit. And then uh, to follow up with the last area, and that's the organized findings. Uh, fortunately, with a uh, vendor rating rubric, which I have a screenshot on the next slide, I'll show you all. Uh, with this, this is a way of 
of really organizing all the information that you have uh, from capturing about the technology you have. It's the, you know, what type of functional requirements, technical requirements, exploratory requirements, uh, what was the feedback on those requirements. Uh, very often uh, that whenever we create these workbooks that tends to be in Excel, that we share them with the client and we have a number of columns where it's a, a comments column or a notes column, a way of a way of talking about each requirement to ensure that our understanding is their understanding and that it can be validated uh, overall, you know, validated with the client. And uh, that's actually, uh, you know, thinking about the exploratory requirements, I always have to grin when thinking about it because uh, at first, uh, you know, when really hashing out exploratory requirements, my goal is always to, to see if I can fit it within one sheet in an Excel file. Uh, but it's amazing how when you start asking questions of like, does this platform need to be uh, like GDPR compliant? Does it have to deal with HIPAA? Does it, um, what kind of subscription modeling does your company support? Does the vendor community, what type of support are you expecting for this technology or technologies? Because uh, that's one thing, you know, really iterating in the very beginning of the presentation is that uh, there's not always just, doesn't always have to be one CAM technology that's being looked at or considered or or maturing or advancing and so forth, it could be a number. So uh, what you see on screen can really scale in size to not only, you know, align with, you know, just one vendor, but it could be a number of vendors. And then you start having to think about, like, do these vendors play nice with each other? Uh, how do the integrations work? And is, are, they, uh, are they fully baked integrations and, and so forth? So there's definitely a lot to consider during this evaluation process. And with that, uh, there's that vendor grade rubric that I was talking about. And this is just an example of what this looks like uh, whenever we're working with it. And uh, this is actually just sheet one. Uh, I think uh, this specific one as an example uh, actually tur usually turns out to be about 20, 25 sheets in a workbook. I know that sounds like a lot. Uh, I would say a number of that's more of like an appendix, but there's just a lot to, to think about and a lot to capture and store when thinking about technology. Uh, an alternative to this, which I'm actually curious to hearing from you all, is what other ways have you all, or effective ways have you all found to capture all these types of requirements and all this feedback in one central location? Um, I have seen success, uh, as an example, using Microsoft Teams. That's been a way of, of really, you know, utilizing uh, SharePoint sites to, to kind of capture the different requirements and then using, uh, you know, the Teams collaboration uh, functionality to really talk about the requirements and to chat about them. But uh, from our standpoint, something that's really been helpful is just keeping it in that, that Excel file and something that can easily be shared and so forth. So in the chat, if you can think of anything that you've used similar or maybe a, a better method, uh, feel free to share. Now, diving into the, to the two, two areas that uh, I would say are really critical when thinking about CAM technology and also Thinking about selecting uh, CAM technology, and that has to do with the uh, vendor demonstrations and the proof of concepts. Both of these are uh, critical when it comes to uh, truly ensuring that a solution will meet the needs of the business and also fit with uh, the technology side of that business. Uh, from the vendor demonstrations aspect, uh, I would say really from a from a best practice standpoint, this is something that uh, is not, I, I haven't seen it very often when talking with vendors because, you know, vendors are usually used to giving a lot of demonstrations is that when asking them to minimize the sales talk that they are already involved with the selection process and being considered that they don't need to talk about sales. Uh, I'm not obviously not going to name names, but there's been a few times where it said, I've asked, please just, you know, give five minutes about who you are, what you do. Uh, and those five minutes have turned into 30 minutes about them and then 30 minutes of a demonstration. And that's very counterproductive because when you're trying to pick a technology, everyone on the that's prepared to select one is already on the page of, okay, we're ready to buy. Let's see what this can do. The last thing they want to see is, oh, another marketing spill. Like they've, you've already been there in that conversation. Let's move past it. So, Definitely, uh, I would say communication is a key thing with vendors. And if you're leading this effort and you're organizing a lot of stakeholders throughout the organization, definitely sit, have, you know, take the time and meet with each, each company or each vendor or 
whoever you're working with to really sit down and, and let them know like this is what the client is prepared to see uh, please just show them this and give them all the tools to succeed and that can be as simple as um, really creating the requirements in advance and kind of making them uh, more more vendor ready more vendor friendly to where it's show how your platform does this show how it does this and then let them know that the client or the individual seeing the demonstration they expect to see this this and this and this and then if you do not accomplish this then this has not been a success so this is the minimum requirements needed for this to be a successful conversation and then to flip to the the proof of concept side uh, could definitely be a whole presentation on just on this just alone just because proof of concepts you know are uh, in themselves you know a, an implementation they are you know you have to define specific requirements or specific use cases that you really want to meet uh, in a short amount of time and it's something that you don't want to spend a lot of money on and more times than not the goal is to try to leverage the uh, the demo software of that vendor to hopefully save costs down the road because uh, you know there's alternative where you buy a full subscription license just to test if that vendor even meets your needs uh, that can be a lot of money that could have gone somewhere else and added a lot more value so um, definitely from you know thinking about from the requirements and, and leveraging the, the the workbook that I previously talked about that rubric it's important to use that rubric all throughout these engagements and these steps to keep continue to capture that information and uh, at the bottom there's this quote uh, I like to say that I said this quote but I think it's just more of like a common sense thing that if things are easy to use then they should be easy to explain uh, it's it's pretty self-explanatory uh, it's very uh, every now and again I get a laugh at it when a vendor's like oh yeah this is a very easy easy thing to do uh, it's this 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 and they go for 30 steps and you're thinking like if I can't understand this there's no way anyone else is gonna understand this so it's definitely not easy and and that's also an opportunity for you to build that relationship with the vendor and say hey you know client or my stakeholder if you want them to like this you should do this and very often do we actually see these uh, these ideas and these suggestions turn into full-fledged fe full fledged features and enhancements so with that uh, I'm going to pass it back to Madison to talk about phase three yeah so phase three uh, really combining both that quantitative and qualitative data that we have expressed or that we've explained in phase one and phase two to make that holistic decision because again how to get to that thoughtful KM technology is really having the tech on one side and the people on the other and really marrying both of their wants and needs to ensure that what you're putting forth is going to be best for the company as a whole. Um, and, and you know that's not rocket science, but it's certainly in our experience uh, has been interesting to see that that disconnect uh, certainly is uh, present in some organizations. And so a lot of the times it will take, as we'll discuss later in phase four, those additional comms or those additional change efforts to really try to bring both parties together uh, for that good. So uh, brief, just, you know, quantitative, it's, you know, anything defined as a number. Um, so a lot of that was coming from those vendor rubrics. Um, Todd does a great job in those rubrics of, you know, weighting certain requirements and giving individuals who are using them an easy way to rate, whether on one to 10, one to five. So compiling all of that, really doing a visual on how did all of those requirements uh, match up with the vendors. Um, and the qualitative side, bringing those personas back out. At EK, we love to print out our personas on a big poster board and really post them around the office so that when we're in the back in our mobile war rooms, um, we have those visuals in front of us. Um, we're constantly thinking about Sam Smith, who is a, uh, a customer service rep and what his day-to-day -day challenges are and, and what he wants and needs to succeed. So having that ability to visualize both your personas and how the rubric played out um, simultaneously in the same room, the same space, really helps you uncover that what and the why. Um, and both of those together uh, will hopefully get you towards that thoughtful CAM technology. But the question is, how do you know and how do you prioritize everything that's in front of you? 
And so we're going to share a few um, prioritization techniques. The first one, uh, Moscow, a relatively well-known prioritization technique out there. So thinking through um, what is critical um, to the KM technology. Um, so that's the must-haves, what um, you should have. So it's considered its top priority, but if we don't do it, the KM solution will still be considered a success, not a failure. Um, could have, you know, nice to have on that list um, potentially is maybe one of those top things in your backlog um, for future iterations and then won't have. So this is, even though um, it, it's not as critical or it's simply not aligned, um, what is just something that someone said that said, you know, hey, that's a great idea. We've heard you, we have acknowledged that either in a, a user story or within the persona, but maybe that is an idea for another, another effort. So thinking through that helps, um, again, a very uh, well-known, easy approach. Um, also at EK, we have done a 3D value prioritization. So um, there is a great blog on our website um, by our knowledge management practice lead, uh, Mary Little, where she goes into uh, further discussion on this. So it's really bringing together that business value, the technical complexity, and foundational value, and plotting them um, on a grid, again, big individualization over here, if y'all haven't caught on to that, uh, but business value, kind of what's that bottom line? What's the likelihood of increasing revenue, productivity? Is it aligned with what we do? Is it aligned with the brand of the initiative we're rolling out? That technical complexity, cost, time, effort. So everything that Todd was talking about um, in the earlier slides of, do we have the in-house staff? Do we have to hire? Will we have to bring on a implementation um, support or a services firm? Can it um, perform within our environment? Can it scale? Um, and then in the end, the, the foundational value, that third factor is, what's the likelihood that this is actually going to increase our operational efficiency, collaboration, and align with our organization's goals. But we also take it a step further. Um, and this is when we bring in the employee value. So again, business value, technical complexity, and foundational value, all great things. But at the end of the day, is this going to bring value to your employees, your knowledge workers, your customer service representatives that are on the phone day in and day out? How do you ensure that you really, really are going to implement a solution that can increase their engagement because they find it functionally applicable to their job. The content is well is accessible. The UI is something they're used to. And also, as we'll talk again, like what is that training and what is that comms um, for that? Is it going to be a heavy lift? Is it going to be something where we're going to have to pull employees out for a few days to do training? Um, are they going to be able to pick it up as they go along because we've mirrored it to things they already know? Um, so just another way to kind of help you think through that prioritization because we always chat that or we always laugh that a lot of the times when we do our qualitative and quantitative uh, data and requirements that we get so in the weeds. But then you have to take that step back in preparing that strategy and that roadmap of, okay, now we're at the 30,000 view, but how do we ensure that we've successfully gone from that granular to that high level? And prioritization and visualization for us is that key. Todd and, and Madison, mm -hmm. um, there was a, a question that was uh, posted to me uh, that I'd like to share from Monica Hanawo. If I'm saying that correctly, Monica asks if my KM approach is the organizational knowledge creation, do you know technology that is appropriate for each knowledge creation process? Technology for every profit, prof, profit of the SECI model. And I can, I can post that to you uh, as well. That would be great. And, you know, I'll take a first stab at it, and then I certainly would want to put it over to Todd for his two cents as well. But, um, you know, Monica, for me, it really sounds that you have a breadth um, that your KM, KM approach and KM technology has to have. So um, what we've done a lot of the times when we're doing a large KM approach that has various business units, um, we recently did one for a international um, financial organization. And a lot of that is doing enough 
at the granule level level within each process or for this case. Um, but then, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, making sure you you bring it up again to that high level. Um, and, and Todd, I'd love your perspective specifically on the technology piece, but Monica, from my perspective of just making sure there's alignment um, is really to make sure you have those visual cues around you or anywhere documented so that you can go in between the granule levels of all the different processes and all the different stakeholders um, to, mm. to really see that alignment across the board. Yeah, I'll, uh, I, I can touch on that a little bit. And I, I had to actually refresh my memory on that because it's been, uh, it's been a little bit since I've heard about that. But yes, uh, so just refresh everyone's uh, memory. Uh, you know, the, the SCCI model you know, has the socialization, externalization, internalization, and combination and uh, in, in the square. And uh, really what stands out to me and, and, you know, just thinking about from a technology standpoint of, you know, being available to help, you know, each one of those, those, those phases or those boxes is that, you know, it, it really breaks it down into explicit and tacit knowledge. When you think about explicit knowledge, that's something that's, that's much easier to capture to store. That's when you have the, the structure, the unstructured information. However, when you start talking about the tacit information, that's when, that's when technology needs help from the rest of KM. That's when you have the people, the process, the content culture, because, you know, you need the you need the flow of information that that tacit knowledge needs to be able to flow in this case from someone's head to uh, technology or to a series of processes to ensure that uh, it's effectively captured and so that it can be socialized and externalized and so forth. So uh, I would say that um, there is definitely technology for every area of of that model, uh, but I would say there's a larger emphasis around ensuring that the rest of KM is there to uh, in place so that technology can enable it. Uh, and I would say one of the much more easier aspects of technology to enable it is definitely focusing on a platform that has not only been gone through all the requirements captured and, and really been uh, visualized, validated by stakeholders, uh, demonstrations and so forth, is that uh, it's also user centric. It's a lot easier to share information when it's easy to share information. Uh, I hope none of you have a, a moment in your day where you're like, oh, I need to write this down. Where do I write it down? Uh, I hope you all never have to have to say that in your day because uh, you know that's, that's where technology should be able to help you. And if you have, ever have to say that, then that's something that, uh, you know, that's where you need to start thinking about, you know, what CAM is in place and then how can technology enable that to be uh, even better. So to, uh, to go to the next part, uh, you know, we've talked about the requirements and the personas and the validation, the prioritization of, you know, thinking about CAM technology and, and seeing the chat here, um, a lot of, a lot of, you know, what the chat is that you all are in different phases of CAM technology. Some of you may just have CAM technology and you just want to make it better. Uh, some of you are in the early phases of selection and you're trying to figure out where to go next. Uh, others are in the thick of things and you're ready to, to you know, get to the selection, do the demonstrations, and you're just maybe thinking of other ideas on how to make it even better. So uh, for this part, you know, for those of you that are working down the process and not better to the, the considerations or for the procurement aspect, procurement aspect uh, I really wanted to outline, you know, three things to, to really, you know, take home with you when thinking about the selection of CAM technology. And that's, you know, first, uh, IT, compliant, legal, they are your friends. Uh, it's a lot easier to procure technology and to implement technology if you're in alignment with those different departments, with those different teams, uh, especially technology. Uh, I've actually seen uh, a few projects, some of them uh, uh, a lot more technology focused, other ones not so much, that should have actually been uh, very technical heavy to where an entire technical solution was ready to be deployed but yet nobody spoke with the physical networking team to make sure that the floor had internet. Uh, there's, it's amazing, uh, you know, what you see out there. And it's just one of those things to, you know, just communicate, you know, share the knowledge that you have for what you're trying to do and ensure that everyone else is on the same page. Uh, second one, prioritize the needs of the end users. 
at the end of the day, you know, you definitely need to incorporate the feedback and the input of those who are actually going to be using the technology. Uh, that's a very important, you know, area of feedback to gather. Um, very, very rarely are uh, implementations or technology successful if there's maybe two to three people that are trying to run a technology through the procurement process that nobody's seen, nobody's used, nobody's tested, and there's that user-centric approach. Um, you're going to find out real quick from the end users if if something's as easy to use as you say it is. And uh, it's definitely something to incorporate sooner rather than later. And then the last piece, and uh, I know you know running low on time or running short, I uh, really want to touch on the last piece is the, the three to five years on the initial purchase price. Um, think about, you know, when you purchase technology, there's that price tag in the very front where it's, oh, this license costs this much. Uh, and I challenge you to also think, how much is it costing you to maintain as is right now? Or to support that solution as is. Uh, there's been a few times where we've done a cost benefit analysis and the ROI to where the amount of money an organization was spending just patching the holes in the technology was a lot more than if they were to start fresh and build, build from scratch. And I challenge you to think from that perspective of not right now, think more of exploratory on, okay, what's this gonna cost down the road? Uh, and with that, you know, down the road, phase four, uh, thinking about, you know, that strategy for success and adoption. And real quick, you know, one of the key things of, of doing this, and as I said, you know, seeing the chat a little bit has to do with, you know, keeping things visual. And it's nice to talk about theory and, and strategy all day, but at the end of the day, uh, there is strategy and implementation. And that's something at EK that, uh, you know, we, we definitely, uh, you know, put our weight behind in that, we, we do both. And we find that when you visualize the roadmap from the very beginning and uh, you start, you know, you start thinking about the design and how it would actually be implemented, it's amazing how actually the, the strategy can change if you start factoring in, okay, how are we actually gonna implement this? And just a few things I wanted to call out uh, with the purple outlines on the system configuration on the bottom left uh, are those key areas. And a lot of these things can be done before you even get to the implementation phase. Like if you're still doing wireframes, the strategy and so forth, you can start setting up that environment. So whenever the strategy and everything is finalized, you can hit the ground running. And it makes, uh, it, makes it a lot easier to stay on time, on track, and it allows you to think, be more proactive instead of reactive. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it to Madison to close us out. Yeah, so again, kind of connecting back to things I said in the beginning, doesn't matter how great the technology is, doesn't matter how great your pretty roadmap is that Todd just showed us. If you do not have change communications and training efforts in place, it'll severely hinder your success. And so at EK, when we talk about building a change management plan, um, again, it's to support not just the implementation, but that adoption and the continuous training. Um, your change in your comm should not start and end on day one. Um, it should, or even day 30, that ending day of the implementation. There should be support for those end users in-house, in continuously going on um, so that they can grow alongside the program. And so kind of the four main component, components of our change plans that we do is you wanna address the fears and concerns um, so again, those kind of come out sometimes during your initial interviews, um, or even sometimes we've gone back and we have interviewed and done sessions with the pilot group or who has been involved in the proof of concept um, from that end user side. Also trying to create that energy, having a demo of it. Some of our organizations in the past, our clients have utilized their TVs in their hallways. Um, they've done a Twitter challenge where it's, you know, we've asked our um, clients have asked their end users to, okay, you know, if you had to pitch this in a Twitter tweet, um, how would you define KM or how would you define KM at said organization? Um, and it, again, demos. Uh, we also have done teasers where you put out a, a link to just that proof of concept and ask people to interact with it. Um, people love things they can touch and they can interact with. It really helps address those fears and build that support um, because it's not just something in the distance that's coming. It's, oh, it's, it's this, um, this is cool. 
also, again, prioritize that transition support and make sure you have that double loop learning and also feedback. So um, it's one thing to receive feedback, but then also communicate out, hey, we did X because you said Y. That really builds that relationship. It promotes transparency, which then builds trust um, and really will ensure that as you go throughout your process of the CAM technology that everyone's on board. And with also the change plan, um, again, comms and training. Um, a lot of the times before you start this portion of your planning, um, make sure you have identified those key stakeholders and users. A lot of the times it is that C-suite executive group, the business owners, the tech leads, and the end users. But every organization is different. Um, you'll know what is best for your organization. So just make sure you take time to think through that. And uh, communications, again, I, I love it. Truth is, it's, it's not a turnkey solution. Um, you really want to plan and take your communications um, organization wide. And we have some listed, uh, again, how you kind of go about those comms plans. And one thing I want to call out for the training is make sure you take a blended approach between classroom, on the job, and that you, again, have that continuous learning, which is informal and formal, um, to ensure that even if someone you know, kind of understands it in the classroom when you teach it or that initial demo. Um, we're all human. We have a thousand things on our mind. Um, you want to make sure that your staff feel supported enough to either seek a refresher or have the means to do it themselves. So with that, um, we will transition, I believe, into questions and comments. Madison, there was a question in the chat that I wanted to bring up first. So Vishal asks, what would be the approach that you recommend when you get mixed feedback from end users? Some liked it and some didn't. Yeah, um, for me, I certainly would try to figure out if they didn't like it, why? Um, so, you know, a lot of the times we just, you're met with a blocker um, and a lot of our change management ex experts go into the various different types of blockers that could be within a solution. So, um, you know, really trying to figure out why they're not liking it. Are they just not liking it because it's changed? Do they actually have a solution that people forgot about that's better instead? Um, were they just felt that they were left out? Um, if it truly comes down to, you know, they like requirement A better than requirement B, putting in that extra work and maybe sitting down with them to kind of show them why requirement A, uh, the one that you have chosen is either more aligned with the business you want to just, at the end of the day, make sure you have an explanation, not just I said so or we said so. Um, have that conversation and be open and honest with them. Um, sometimes in my, in my experience, they've uncovered something that we didn't see, um, and that's why they didn't like it. And we're like, oh, like, great point. Um, and again, sometimes it's just they're a blocker for various reasons. So taking that extra time, um, and exactly as Retha said in the chat, to stay objective and really listen. Um, will will get you the most success there. And I would I would add to that that uh, I would say first it's it's actually good that you're getting mixed feedback because uh, more times than not, uh, especially when talking about technology, uh, you can have those meetings where you know the entire line is quiet. And when you get mixed feedback, it's a good sign that people are actually engaged and are caring. Uh, I would say from you know another standpoint, you know this is also you know, of the approach of doing this metric evaluation of, you know, definitely, you know, keep track of, of that, that mixed feedback to ensure that it's not only uh, recorded, because, you know, everyone's voice counts in this. It's, it's something that's important. Mm -hmm. And during this evaluation, you know, understand, like, does it apply to one requirement, many requirements? What are the priorities of those requirements? And you definitely want to, to have that feedback reflected in your findings and how you start measuring the value of, of that feedback. And, and now you can turn that into an evaluation. So thank you for that question. This is Linda. Um, we've got one minute. Maybe we can do a, one quick question. I do know Madison can stay after a few minutes um, as well, if anyone else can. And there's additional questions um, uh, for Madison. So is there anyone would like to ask a final question? If not, I know Todd, if you can go to the next slide, our contact information is up. Um, feel free to tweet at us, send us an email, LinkedIn. Um, more than happy to continue this conversation uh, moving forward just outside of this space. And so, uh, oh, here we go. One more.
one last question. Todd, do you want to take this one? Yeah, Melinda, I can stay for a, a few more minutes. Uh, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so best practice uh, you can share from doing migration from one knowledge base to another. Uh, I, I first, you know, I guess, you know, first question is, is, are you upgrading from, you know, let's say like the SharePoint 2007 to uh, SharePoint Online? So I'd first ask, you know, is it more of like a migration? And then, you know, start factoring in, um, you know, how many resources do you have with you to to help with this? With this, um, For example, uh, one of the big things is, uh, are you trying to do this manually or through technology? Uh, sometimes you have the resources to where you have to manually copy and paste, cut and paste, or you have to do it through the database. Other times you have to define a uh, maybe you have millions of documents you need to do it uh, through technology. So I would say best practices is more or less, um, you know, what, I guess from the technical standpoint, what type of format is expected to be received? It would be uh, really how fast you're wanting to do this. And I think a big one uh, definitely see very often has to do with, uh, you know what what's the added functionality of of doing this migration why are you actually doing this migration and madison i think there's there would be a few from a uh, from the user perspective that we've heard yeah and so um michelle one thing what i would recommend is um, making a large content cleanup um, spreadsheet and identifying content owners um, just again so that people have some ownership within the process it's make sure you update it as um, either maintain as is update archive or delete and uh, as you probably know there's so many steps in a content migration process so what we've done in the past is we've used some gamification techniques to really incentivize individuals to participate and how we've done that was we made a km site where there was a dashboard that showed at any given time how many individuals had so many points and our km uh, champion team which mirrored their management team was always in charge of um, validating the points and you know giving out those you know virtual stickers so as people accumulated points um, this organization was very uh, internally competitive so they enjoyed it and they had fun and at the end of the the each i believe each week or so um there was a prize that they could work towards and then all the stats reset because one thing also in gamification is um, you never want to keep the leaderboard going for so long that people feel that they can never be a winner um, so making sure that along that content migration process, things are being reset. Um, also because people have different roles at different times, be more um, engaged at certain times. When you use gamification for incentives, make sure you're always kind of equalizing that benchmark or you're going to instead um, actually discourage participation throughout the migration process. So hopefully those are you know, the two sides of the best tricks and best practices. Any other questions? It's, thank you, Todd and Madison, for staying a few minutes. And thank you, everyone, um, for coming. Yes, and to you, too, uh, Todd and Madison, so much for the great insights and, and learning you shared with us today. I mean, I've learned a, a, a lot today and really enjoyed it. And thanks to um, and for putting in the time and, and really um, uh, engaging, engaging us today and thanks to everyone who joined please feel free everyone to continue to join the rest of this week as Susan said and into next week and uh, we hope to see you tomorrow <laughs>